Hello and welcome. This is the Explore the Bible Sunday School lesson for First Baptist Church Alabaster for May the 10th, 2020, which is Mother's Day. So don't forget that it is Mother's Day. The title of today's lesson is Sacrifices. We'll be looking at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, 9, and then jump over to 9 through 18. So I hope you have your word, uh, uh, your copy of the word of God, and turn to Romans chapter 12, and we'll begin with the first verse. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now let's turn over to verse 9. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek, not, uh, and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now in Romans chapter 1 through 11, Paul gives the logical presentation of God's graciousness in providing the gospel. In chapters 12 through 16, Paul applies the gospel to uh, living the Christian life. We are encouraged to devote ourselves to God as living sacrifices. He then focuses on the church as the laboratory, if you will, in which we are to live out this commitment. Paul also encourages, encourages his readers to walk, walk in love. Now, stating this another way, a believer shared with his pastor that the gospel has two sides, a believing side and a behaving side. Now, in the early chapters of Romans, Paul emphasized the believing side of the gospel. In later chapters of Romans, Paul concentrates on the behaving side of the Christian faith. Now, looking at the first two verses of chapter 12, uh, offer yourself. The King James Version says, I beseech you, therefore, brother, or brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies. Now, the English Standard Version uses the phrase, I appeal to you. And then other translations will say, I encourage or I urge. Paul is calling his readers alongside himself as he encourages us to live lives in keeping with the gospel. He is basing his exhortation on God's mercies shown toward us. Now the phrase, present your bodies. The word present really means to stand alongside. The Jewish historian Josephus said the word present was used in the time as a priest uh, bearing a dead sacrifice. He would take it to the altar and present it to God. Paul was challenging us to present our bodies to God as a living sacrifice. If our sacrifice is to be acceptable to him, it must be holy and set apart for his use only. Now, to be set apart was the original meaning of the word holy. But it took on an additional meaning of moral purity when it came to be used of Jehovah and taking on his moral attributes. If our bodies are to be dedicated to God, they must be holy as he is holy. For one truly to be a living sacrifice, God desires the total person body, intellect, emotions, will, and spirit. 
we can voluntarily place ourselves under his control for his own glory and purposes. All our decisions and actions then become an offering of, uh, an offering of spirit-directed service to God. Now we move to verse 2. Don't do as the world does. Don't fade into crowd as one of the vast wave of people. Don't let the world decide what you're going to do or what you're going to be. Be changed. Renew your mind. Let God transform you. Don't be self-centered, but be Christ-centered. Be Christ-controlled. The challenge for the Christian is to live in the world, but not become like it. The world would like to control your mind, but God wants to transform your mind. So let outward actions be in harmony with your inner convictions. If with God's help we accomplish this, it will allow us as believers to prove that the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. God gives us the power and capacity to, to discern these things. Are you conformed or are you transformed? One writer reminds us that your mind controls your will and your will controls your actions. Let's also be reminded that Satan tries to deceive us into believing God makes impossible demands on our lives. The truth is that what God requires of us he empowers us to accomplish. Now moving over to verse 9 through 13, living authentically. In verse 9, the English Standard Version says to love, uh, love must be genuine. This means that we must love without hypocrisy. We cannot claim to serve God and not have love for others. The word for love here is agape. And this is the highest kind of love. It is a love that characterizes the nature of God, for God is love. Unfortunately, some people, even some Christians, pretend to love someone out of a selfish motive. Uh, to get, maybe to gather favor or to get something they want. We must not be hypocritical in pretending to love others. Our love must be genuine love. We must also hate evil. Again, unfortunately, what many people hate is not evil, but it's the consequences of evil, or the consequences of being bad. John Stott puts it this way, It may seem strange that the exhortation to love is followed immediately by a command to hate, but we should not be surprised. For love, which is agape love, is not the blind sentiment it is traditionally said to be. On the contrary, it is discerning. It is so passionately devoted to the beloved object that it hates every evil which is incompatible with his or her highest welfare. We must also cling to what is good. We must be kind and loving toward our fellow believers. The love uh, we are to have toward each other as children of God is like a loving family and uh, as they would love each other. We are not to be slothful. Basically, we're not to be sluggish or lazy. We should be at our best at all times. We're to be fervent in spirit. And Paul probably had the Holy Spirit in mind, uh, so we are to be, uh, someone said, like, on fire with the Spirit. Or another person said, we are to be aglow with the Spirit. We are to be about serving the Lord with unbridled enthusiasm. We are, to, we are to rejoice in hope and allow this hope to keep us joyful. And we're to be patient in tribulation. Through the strength which Christ provides us, we can remain steadfast and persevere in whatever may be occurring in our lives and thereby being an encouragement to other believers. We must remain persistent in our prayers. The words constant and faithful will fit well here. Would you call these days we are presently in 
a period of tribulation? I think I would. I encourage you to be prayerful for yourself as well as prayerful for fellow believers. Let your generosity abound in sharing with fellow believers and others that may be in need. This too will strengthen the fellowship of believers. I'm reminded of our food ministry and the many volunteers we have um, to provide this ministry. Uh, they work well together. Um, they encourage each other and I think they are a tremendous witness to our community as they serve our community in providing and giving food to them. We're just to display hospitality. Now this is, does not mean that we're simply to be polite uh, and courteous, but we are to seek after those that we might assist and help with kindness and good deeds. So what gifts do you have that could help others? How have you been blessed so that you could provide blessings to others? Think about those questions. And now let's move to verses 14 through 18 and being at peace. Paul identified several situations in which uh, relating to others is sometimes difficult. He gave specific guidance for problems related to persecution, joys, sorrow, conflict, and pride. Consider three guidelines for how Christians can relate with genuine love to other people. First, pray for your persecutors in verse 14. Basically, we are to speak blessings on those who persecute you. We are to bless and not curse those who cause us trouble. Second, we are to emphasize empathize with people in verse 15. We are to be in tune with the feelings of others around us. That means we are to care and take time with others in order to know how we might be helpful. Thirdly, we are to gladly associate with all kinds of people. If we are secure in Christ, we can see the good in others and be encouragers. Even though we may be saved and someone we're ministering to may not be saved, we are never to think of ourselves as highly or too highly, and we're never to think ourselves better than others. We know that God loves everyone and desires for them to be saved, and that should be our desire as well for them to be saved. And looking at verses 17 through 18, we are to love our enemies by doing what is honest and right. Our honesty should be evident not only to God, but to all who know us. Our reputation should be one of fair-mindedness and honesty. Christ is the truth, and we are to live in the truth. We must demonstrate lo love toward our enemies by living peaceably with all people. Being at peace with God breaks down barriers and puts us at peace with others. There will be many times when people do not reciprocate this desire of peace, and they'll remain disagreeable, and they will have no desire to be have peace with you or me. This is why Paul said, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. We must make the extra effort always. As we trust God and practice the principles of the Holy Spirit led Paul to give us, we will not be overcome by evil, but we will overcome evil with good. If you will, allow me to leave you with this question. I'd encourage you to go back to verse 2, uh, but I'd encourage you to read the whole chapter of Romans uh, 12, if you would. But look at verse 2 and paraphrase the words Paul gives us. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Paraphrase those words, if you will. And as we continue to experience these days, the Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing. Paul tells us in Philippians that there uh, would never be a crisis so troubling that God could not bring peace in the midst 
of it. So if you're feeling anxious, I would encourage you to turn your anxiety over to God. And my prayer for you is that the perfect peace, or that his perfect peace, will guard your heart.